Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the weeds sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked them, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them into bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. God bless the reading and hearing of his holy word. Pray together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I was so excited this year that I had gone out to Walmart and we had found some packages of seeds. And I figured that when it came time for these seeds, we would have our fair share of peppers, our fair share of cantaloupes, our fair share of tomatoes, our fair share of squash, all different types. But then I realized something. I waited for it to open the package. I got the seeds, I had them ready. I sat them on the counter right there and ready for sunshine. And I've had them sitting right there on the kitchen windowsill waiting and wondering and still beginning to wonder why have i not any squash why have i not any peppers and why have i not any tomatoes you see the reason why i discovered and the ingenious idea is that you have to open the package you have to then put the seeds in the soil you then have to care for the seeds in the soil to help the seeds to grow to produce a crop to produce a harvest to produce but then with those that I did plant I noticed that they didn't look like the pictures and there were some odd green objects that were coming up around these plants they were taking over these plants and I thought maybe it was a different type of fruit that needed to be eaten but those were weeds and you know, in order for the crop to grow, the weeds need to be weeded. Things need to be prepared and ready and prepared for what is yet to come. And that's what Jesus gives in the parable this morning. Jesus tells them yet another parable about a man who goes out to sow seeds. He throws the seeds in good soil. And then an enemy comes along in the middle of the night. And what does the enemy do? He plants weeds. Weeds that look exactly like the seed of wheat that he is planting to choke out, to strangle, to make it so confusing, so different, so difficult for one to begin to see what is truly the crop and what is truly the weed. Now, Jesus tells this parable for a reason as he's beginning to tell them about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and what has come and what is yet to come within that kingdom. So look with me in your Bibles just for a couple minutes as we look at this passage of Scripture in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, which my daughter read here this morning. And starting at verse number 24, it starts off in verse number 24 like, four, like this. Jesus told them. Now, who's the them? We don't believe the them to be the apostles. We need the them to be the crowd. He wasn't just focusing in on a small, select group of people. He's telling everybody that the kingdom of heaven has arrived, that the kingdom of heaven is here, that the time has come, that God has put in place his plan so that all can come to accept, so that all can come to believe, so that all can gain the true inheritance of eternal life. And he told them yet another parable 
Another parable. Jesus uses, like I've told you before, this type of teaching method. And once again, as we see later in this chapter, in verses 36 through 43, the disciples still didn't comprehend. Last week, we talked about how could they not, if they cannot comprehend the simple, how are they going to comprehend the complex? And once again, the disciples came to him and said, we just don't get it. We just don't understand but they did recognize that when they did not understand, they did recognize when they just didn't get it, they knew to go directly to the teacher. Jesus is that good teacher. But how about you? When you don't understand the questions of life, when you don't understand what God is doing, when you don't understand and begin to question because God does not make sense, where do you turn? Stop turning to your own head knowledge. Stop turning to things that are man-made, but turn to God and ask your questions. God doesn't mind, and God, we shouldn't be afraid to ask God the simple question, why? But we must, when we ask God the question, why, we must be willing to listen to his answer. Even if it makes us feel uncomfortable even if it's not what we wanted even if it's not what we hoped for even if it's not what we were thinking was the best plan for our lives and jesus in this parable is speaking about the kingdom of heaven jesus goes on to say in the parable in verse number 24 the kingdom of heaven now this message along with matthew's attendant audience the jews is the term is synonymous with also the term the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, they're interchangeable with each other because it's the same exact thing. But because the Jews did not like to name God, because they were concerned of finding themselves profane, profaning his name, you will see the phrase kingdom of heaven more frequently used, especially in this gospel. To a, to a tune of 31 times you hear the phrase kingdom of heaven in the gospel of Matthew and five times you hear the kingdom of God but both are speaking about a kingdom that our heavenly father is establishing that we are called to be a part of and to be proud of being a part of it it exists both in heaven but also here on earth if you are a believer you are a member of the kingdom of God if you are a member of the kingdom of God, you are a member of God's family. It doesn't matter what tribe or what church you belong to, you are a member of the same kingdom. So often we try and focus and bringing people into our church instead of being focused on bringing people into the kingdom. It's not about building this church or building another church. It's about building the kingdom of God. That is what is going to save you. That is what is going to allow you to enter those gates of heaven. Not by a church membership, not by a church participation, not by a church attendance, but by a belief in Jesus Christ is the only way. And he says the kingdom of heaven is like, is like what? Is like a man, not just any man. The owner is not like any man. He's the son of man. The son of man that is described by the prophet Daniel. In Daniel chapter 7, verse number 13. The son of man, Jesus Christ himself, is the one that has sowed the seed. Jesus Christ himself is the one that has allowed us to enter into that kingdom. Without Jesus Christ, you will not be saved. Jesus Christ is the one that left so that the Holy Spirit could come to equip the followers. So that they could carry out the mission. The mission of what? The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God. So that we as believers can go forward proclaiming that message to a world that is lost. To a world that is depraved. To a world that is wandering in circles and not finding its right path and its right way. Because they don't recognize that Jesus is the way. Now this son of man comes and the gracious is the son of man. And he comes in such a way. And the reason why Matthew uses the term son of man instead of that of Messiah. Is because of the misconnotation. The miscon the mis boy, 
Uh, type that on the tongue and try and get out there. Of that of the Messiah by the Jews. They thought that the Messiah was going to come as a great army official. He was going to overthrow the Roman government. And he was going to reestablish the kingdom of David here on earth. But the Son of Man, the Son of Man's purpose was to come with a gracious gift of forgiveness. A gift of forgiveness that comes through God. That forgiveness that comes through the remembrance of what Jesus Christ did with his body. And what he did with the blood, when the blood was shed on the cross, to wash away your sins and my sins. Now, what was Jesus' purpose on earth? 1 Timothy verse 1 verse 15 puts it this way. His purpose on earth was to rescue sinners. You see, friends, when we don't have Jesus, we are out there on the water without a lifeboat. We are out there on the water without any safety harness, and we don't know how to swim. Jesus Christ comes right along, scoops us up, and saves us and rescues us from the pain and punishment of our life. And he said, this man sowed good seed. Good seed stands for the people of the kingdom of God. Stands for the people, as Jesus later went on to describe to the Pharisees, it's very easy to unpack the meaning behind this parable. Why? Because Jesus told it. But what do we need to do? John chapter 1, verse number 12. Let me read you this verse in John 1, 12. Here's what he says. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Do you believe you see, that's the good. The good is the message. The good is the good news that comes in the fact that we have the right, we have the ability to be children of God. We have the right to receive the inheritance, an inheritance that we have not earned, an inheritance that we do not deserve, but an inheritance that has been given to us by the grace of God because he loves us. And all we have to do is believe. Salvation comes not by a little prayer. Salvation comes not by things that come out of our mouth. Salvation comes by a simple fact of believing and trusting that God sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for your sins and for my sins. And he said, he sowed the seed in the field. The field that we're talking about here is the world. Notice he's not talking about Israel. He's talking to the Jews. He's not saying he sowed the seed amongst Israel. He's not even saying he sowed the seed in the church. He's saying he sowed the seed in the world. What is the world? Genesis 1 tells us that God created the world. And everything in the world was good. And God saw that it was good. As he broke it down in days. What tells us about that? Everything in the world is his. You can't give God anything that he doesn't already have. Because it's already his. We often live in a hostile world to Jesus. Sometimes things seem opposite of how we think they should be. When unbelieving and corrupt people seem to prosper and be blessed, it frustrates me to no end. While believers suffer. While believers are persecuted, while believers are even fail, this doesn't seem fair. Why does God allow this to happen? And he goes on to say in verse number 25, however, however, he says, while everyone was sleeping, sleeping here in the Greek says an opportune time when people's guards are down, they may even become apathetic. They may even become lazy. How many apathetic Christians are in the world today? How many lazy Christians are in the world today that think they can just come, they can sit in the pew for the hour, they can say, I saw you, Jesus, I'll be back again next week. You stay here like a good little boy, and I'll come back and get you next week, and I'll come and meet you again. You see, Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship, and it's our, rela our responsibility to take that relationship and be that number one relationship wherever we go and with whomever we come in contact with. What's the problem? 
We are losing a battle because we don't even recognize we're in the battle. I had a preacher friend put it this way to me the other day. We're spiritual streepers. <laughs> spiritual streepers. Think about it for a minute. Paul told the Ephesians that we are to put on the full armor of God. But what do we do? We go through life and we don't recognize that our problem is not against flesh and blood. But our problem is against the principalities, the evil forces of this world, the spiritual realm. We don't recognize the spiritual battle and we go into battle naked. Huh? Naked and looking at this in a spiritual sense, in a spiritual way. Why? Because we do not put on the helmet of salvation. We do not put on the breastplate of righteousness. We do not put on the belt of truth. We do not carry with us the shield of faith. We do not have the, the feet ready for the readiness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we don't carry the sword of the spirit with us wherever we go. The word of God should be in not only in our pockets, but it also should be in our hands. Think about it for a minute. How valuable is the word of God for you? Let me give you a test. If you left your Bible and you left your cell phone at home and you were driving away, which one do you turn around for? Thank you. But think about it for a minute. If you turn around and you say, well, you know, I don't need to turn around for the Bible. I can read that later. I'm not going to need that with me because I'm just going out driving. I turn around for both. But you know, you look and you see that so many people begin to recognize so many people begin to put a value and say, well, you know what? I don't need this for the battle. And then they go into battle and they lose. Matthew 26, verse number 40, when Jesus was in the garden, before he was being handed over, his three friends, his three closest friends went up there and he asked them to pray with him. And what they do? They slept. So what am I encouraging us to do? What is Jesus encouraging us to do? Stay awake and be alert. The devil doesn't come at a time until with a pitchfork and a tail and horns in his head with a name tag that says, hello, my name is Satan. He comes at a time when we have our defenses down. He comes at a time when we are not prepared for him to come and he sneaks in. The enemy of God is the devil. And we must recognize that the enemy of God, the devil, wants God to succeed in nothing, wants his people to succeed in nothing. So what's he going to do? He's going to attack us when our guard is down. Friends, we must recognize that evil is real in the world. Christians today are uncomfortable with the idea of the devil. And for the most part, many pastors and teachers ignore it in their preaching. However, unwill unwillingness to speak plainly about the devil and to confront evil in our midst doesn't mean that it doesn't go away or it doesn't exist. I'm going to let you in on a secret about my kids. A secret that may shock you. A secret that may be tough living in a German community. My kids don't like sauerkraut. I... None of them like sauerkraut. So we just ignore that there is sauerkraut. But that doesn't mean that it's removed from the grocery store. My kids can say, you know what? We don't believe that there's sauerkraut. But you know what? No matter how much we don't believe there's sauerkraut, you go to the Isle of Bronson's, there's going to be sauerkraut. But it doesn't mean because we don't speak the name sauerkraut that there is no sauerkraut. You may think that's silly. You may think he's gone off the deep end today. But we do the same thing about the devil. We do the same thing about evil. We do the same thing about sin in the life of the church today. And what did the devil do? What did his enemy do? He came to sow. Look at what it says here. It says he came to sow. He came to sow wheat. What? He came to sow weeds, weeds among the wheat, and he went away. When that wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? Look and see who's to blame. Look and see who they blame. They didn't blame themselves. They didn't blame themselves for sleeping. They blamed the good owner. It has to be God's fault. When things go wrong in your life, who do you blame? 
How often do we stop and we blame God? Why did God allow this to happen to me? Why does God allow bad things to happen in the world? Why does God allow this? Why does God? Why is God doing that? Instead of looking at the root of the problem, we put a blame on somebody who shouldn't be blamed for the problem. And an enemy, and he said, an enemy did this. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. The servant creepily, without notice, and not in the light. Kind of like in Hanna-Barbera. I'm going to show my age for a moment. Hanna-Barbera, dastardly, <laughs> dastardly creeping in. You can see him with a little mustache. And he's going to come in and he's going to sneak and he's going to, he's going to do a Wile E. Coyote. Wile E. Coyote is the whole plan of the cartoon of Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner is the fact that Wile E. Coyote wants to catch the Roadrunner and does everything set out, sneaks up in mountains, sneaks on in places. He doesn't come in full view and full vice of that of the Roadrunner. That's how I picture this picture of that of this evil man that's lurking. He lurks like a lion, ready to pounce. The weeds themselves being children of the evil one. What did he sow? He sowed darnel weeds. I don't know if you know anything about darnel weeds. It resembles wheat in its early stages, making it almost impossible to identify. Sowing darnel seed among the wheat was a common act of sabotage during the Old Testament and Jewish time. In fact, to the point that the Romans had a law against it. There was a law against sowing darnel weeds in your enemy's seed field. As the plants mature, the roots of the weeds and the weeds intertwine, making them almost impossible to separate any attempt to pull the weeds will also pull the wheat. But he goes on in verse number 30, the last verse. He says, let us both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and then tie them in bundles to be buried. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. The harvest at the end of the age. The reapers are the angels, Jesus describes. You see, separation is necessary because darnel is both bitter and mildly toxic. If not removed prior to milling, darnel will ruin the flower. We hear that expression, not about darnel, but what does a rotten apple do to a bushel? It ruins the whole bushel. And it needs to be removed. Remove that rotten apple and the bushel will be fine and the bushel will be good. Now, Jesus doesn't picture the God removing godly people from the world, but instead pictures angels removing evildoers from the kingdom. You see, there's a choice, people. Eternity will last forever. That's the reason why it's called eternity. If it didn't last forever, they'd call it something beside it. Non-eternity, probably. But in looking at this, eternity is decided by what seed you are. What seed you grow from. The weeds, the evil ones, will be wrapped up together and will be thrown into the fire. A fire, Gehenna, a fire of sulfur, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, as Jesus describes, known to us as hell. And people will be brought into the barn who believe that is heaven. A barn, or says in contemporary Christian music, or at least contemporary to me, a big, big house, where there will be no more weeping, There'll be no more sorrow, there'll be no more pain, there'll be no more death, for the old order of things has passed away. But see, this parable deals with a very practical problem in the church. We find bad mixed with good. Churches have members whose conduct is embarrassing, whose ethics are questionable, or who treat people unkindly, who advocate questionable doctrine, and here's what we're going to recognize. We are not called to tolerate the intolerable. Let me straight that, instead get that stress to you. We are not called to tolerate the intolerable. We need to apply the principle of forbearance to those outside the church. And we also have been given a method for reproving sinners by Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. You see, God continues to sow his seed of his word in human hearts and loves to bear fruit. He is sowing his people in the world where they can produce a harvest. Jesus calls us to trust that he will separate the good from the bad on Judgment Day. Now it's time to self-evaluate just for a moment before we go to communion. 
and make changes in your life if needed. Here's the questions that I have for you. Questions for you to reflect on for just a moment. Is your profession of Jesus Christ authentic? Or will you be seen as a counterfeit in the end of the age? Does your hearts receive the word? You see, the seed has life and power and can produce a harvest of blessings in your life. Do you hear it? And the last one. Can God plant you where he wants you? How easy it is for us to put our feet in the ground and say, no, God, this is too strange. I don't like change. Too many firsts, too many things all at one time. You're a seed containing his divine life, but a seed must be planted in order to produce the fruit. No matter how long I stared at these packages, if I don't plant them in the ground, all they're going to be is seeds in a package. You need to be willing to be planted where God wants to plant you, in a soil where he wants to plant you, so that he can use you and serve, you can serve him and do great and mighty things for his kingdom. He wanted to get the people to open their eyes and ears and receive the truth into their sluggish hearts. Look and see. Is my heart sluggish? If so, open your eyes and ears. Open your eyes and ears to what? To the love that God has for us, that he was willing to give the ultimate sacrifice. He was willing to say, I love you so much that I was willing to come to earth and allow my body to be broken on the cross. And we are not to forget that sacrifice that has been made. He also loved us so much that it didn't just stop with the body, but it went to the blood. Why? Because blood is the life source of the body. Life comes through the blood, the book of Leviticus says. And our eternal life comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's time for us to prepare our hearts. It's time for us to prepare our minds. It's time for us to not take lightly, oh, it's the first Sunday of the month. Time to get a snack again. Not but to prepare our hearts and minds for communion. I'm going to take a minute and pause for you to silently get yourself ready for communion at this time.